will start with a prayer. Om Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Today we are going to study the human personality paradigms in Eastern and Western philosophy. Human personality paradigm, which means what is the human personality about? Human personality is defined as a dynamic set of characteristics, a dynamic and organized set of characteristics unique to individuals upon which depend are your motivations, your thoughts, your actions, your behavior, everything depends on these set of characteristics which are unique to the individual. So, this is what we generally call personality. Now, you have a number of personality workshops, all this is going on, but to understand personality, the very word in depth, you must uh, think about the whole thing, you know, not just how as you appear to be. In uh, earlier in Greece, you know, actors used to talk through a mask. Suppose they had to portray the uh, personality of a king, they would have the mask of a king and they would speak through that mask. So, that came to be called persona, us mask ko persona bolte the. From that is derived personality. The Latin word persona means mask and from that is derived personality. Iska matlab hai, whatever we think ourselves to be, this body mind complex, we are actually functioning through it. If you think deeply about yourself, in the last class some small amount of meditation we did on this, these lines. If you think and see, even thought is objective to your experience you are functioning through this mechanism. So, your personality should cover the whole thing, is not it? Eastern uh, philosophies may essay karte, they actually take up personality as a trichotomous structure, which means there is the body externally, there is the mind and there is the Atman or self. It is due to the presence of this Atman consciousness that the body and mind are enlivened and we have this tendency to identify with the body mind complex and we consider that much only to be our personality. So, we are always polishing the surface, but the fact about you is you are a unit of consciousness functioning through a body mind complex. So, the general paradigm of human personality in eastern traditions, meditative traditions, philosophical traditions is a trichotomous structure. Did you get the point? Hmm? In western philosophy it is primarily dichotomous, it is body and mind and the higher mind is called the soul. So, we will go into that also, but first let us cover the eastern paradigm of human personality. Now, here when we are talking of self, when we are talking of the Atman, last class we had a some amount of discussion on this. See what are, what are they exactly trying to tell you? If you go to the Keno Upanishad, Keno Upanishad is an Upanishad which starts off with a wonderful description of self who is the real I, the unchanging I in me. It starts off with a definition. See the question put there to the teacher initially as the Upanishad starts is kene shitam patati preshitam manaha kena prana prathama praiti yuktaha kene shitam vachamimam vadanti chakshu shrotra kahu deo yunakti which means what is, what is it that impels my mind to go towards objects? What is the starting point? Look at the gravity of the question, this is what I want you to see. What is it that makes my mind function? Hmm. This is what he is asking by saying kene shitam patati preshitam manaha, kena prana prathama praiti yuktaha. What is it that makes my vital energies function? Driven by what do they go and join themselves? Do they move? Driven by what do I speak? What is speech? What is the source of speech? What is the source of my faculty of sight, of hearing? This is the question. Are you getting the, the immensity of the question? Hmm? He is asking for how is perception becoming possible? 
how is mind activity becoming possible? And then the answer given is also very deep. The answer given is Shrotrasya Shrotram Manaso Manoyat Vachoha Vacham Sau Pranasya Pranaha Chakshushcha Chakshu Atimuchya Dhira Pretya Smalokad Amrita Bhavanti. That which is the source of all this activity and perception, that is actually Shrotrasya Shrotram, he is saying, the year of your year. Manaso Manoyat, the mind of your mind, the eye of your eye, the vital energy of the vitality of your vital energy. And one who gets to this source factor, he is able to come out of the sense life and attain immortality. This is how it is described. Now you see this very phrase, it is the year of the year, it is the eye of the eye, how significant it is. Iska matlab hai, piche aisa kuch force hai, there is something which impels your sense organ to go and join with the sense object, makes perception, simple perception possible. So this we will be studying in a very big way in the next class because the session is on mind and perception. But basically here, you should catch this point that it is being the, your sense organs are being driven by something, there is some factor, some force within you which is making that perception possible. The mind itself, if you study simple perception, immediately this question will pop up to you. You see, when you see any object, photons are being thrown into your visual, into your visual cortex actually. Photons are colorless, it is electromagnetic radiation. It goes into your brain and some neurochemistry happens there and you do not perceive photons, you do not perceive neurochemistry, you are perceiving a whole set of wonderful colors, objects, a three dimensional world in real time and space. So how is this becoming possible? So you see actually science gives you the connection between the object and your brain activity and Yoga Vedanta throw light on the sequence from your brain activity to consciousness. So the whole thing you can get if you, that is why I said combining objective and subjective sciences, it will unveil a huge amount of knowledge for us. So this possibility, this Upanishad is hinting at by telling you it is the mind of the mind, it is the year of the year, that is the nature of consciousness. You know later on in these very verses, in these mantras, they will be telling us manasana manute, yenahur manomatam tadeva brahmatvam vidhi nedam yadidam upasate which means you cannot know it with the mind, but it is through that consciousness that the mind knows. That is called Brahman and not this that people objectively worship here. Yash chakshushana pasyati yena chakshumshi pasyati tadeva brahmatvam vidhi nedam yadidam upasate. Your eyes cannot see it. Can you see consciousness with your eyes? But it is due to the presence of consciousness that the eyes are functioning, that you are seeing. And this is that Brahman and not this which people objectively worship. It goes on like this. Na shrotrena shunoti yena shrotram idam shrutam tadeva brahmatvam vidhi nedam yadidam upasate. You cannot hear it with your ears, but due to its presence the ears are hearing. That is this Brahman consciousness which you yourself are. It is your real nature. Do not think Brahman is another concept, another object supreme reality like that. The I in you signifies a unit of consciousness which is called Brahman. Your own real nature, aapka astitva jo hai, aapka jo parichai hai, swaroop hai, usi ke baare mein research hai. The real I in you, the unchanging element in you. Think and see, body and mind are constantly changing. As I told you, if I showed you a picture of your own infanthood, you will not recognize the picture you may or may not recognize the picture, that much the body has changed. But you have a tendency to feel you are that same person, that same baby became a toddler, teenager, now you are a young man or young woman. So what is, the, what is this continuity that we feel? The I has remained the same, although body has changed, mind has changed immensely. So there is an unchanging element in you of the nature of awareness, consciousness which they are researching into. This is what they are telling you about your real self. This is supposed to be the core of your personality structure because it is the only unchanging element about you, which is called the self. And that is why the Upanishads 
again and again. This is the recurring theme of the Upanishads, the real you, the unchanging you. And they will tell you that research into this is possible. They researched into it and found that you are of the nature of consciousness, immortal, eternal, the very essence of being, the very essence of consciousness and the changeless one. In the midst of all this change, there is a changeless unit which you actually are and that is what they are calling the Atman and there is a way to discover this Atman. I was very profoundly affected when your um, faculty introduced the word discovery into this course. Uh, they have given the title of the course as discovery and management of self. They actually wanted to know about self-discovery. So it is possible to go into these great depths of your own personality. Otherwise, you know, you will have a very superficial definition of yourself. Agar hum uh, is stand, is yahan tak na jaye, what will be our understanding of ourselves? Well, I am my thoughts, I am this body, I am these senses, this much will be our understanding of ourselves. But there is something more to you, an unchanging datum behind all this, which is the most profoundest aspect of your personality because it does not change. It is what is lighting up everything else and that is why the mind is functioning, the senses are functioning. So, this picture of yourself, this knowledge of yourself is vital to your understanding the human personality. It is the source of your knowledge, it is the source of your power, it is the source of everything about you in fact. Because, because of the presence of consciousness, you are having conscious experiences in the mind and that is how you are perceiving this world through your mind. So, you see that is the source factor. To illustrate this, Upanishads use so many techniques. There are meditation techniques, there are Upasanas, there are Vidyas and there are stories also given out to help you understand this. Let me tell you one beautiful story here so that you catch the point firmly. This story also occurs in the Keno Upanishad. It is a very profound Upanishad. This story goes like this. It seems once there was a quarrel between the Devas and Asuras in heaven. This is a story just to illustrate, tell you about something very profound about yourselves. So, observe the story. There was a quarrel between, there are periodic quarrels between Devas and Asuras. So, during one such uh, war, the Devas managed to drive the Asuras out of heaven. And once the Asuras left and they were killed and hammered and thrown out, the Devas became very happy and jubilant because they had won the war and they started celebrating and the celebrations went on for a long time. So, you know who these devas are? The gods with the small g, uh, they are like divine offices in heaven. This is how it is conceived. Um, it is like Indra who is the, uh, the god of the heaven, Varuna who is the god of the waters. They are all uh, offices, divine offices in control of each element. Ek ek panchabhut ke devata hai ye. Agni is in charge of fire, Vayu is in charge of wind. Hmm? So, these gods, they are called lesser gods in uh, Hinduism. So, these gods started uh, feeling very arrogant about their victory and they went on celebrating, they were over enthusiastic, over jubilant. So, then God, which Brahman, hmm, the supreme consciousness, he thought that these must be, they must be taught a lesson. They must be uh, they must be made to think who is it who is responsible for their victory, what is the source of their victory. So, he appeared before them in the form of a yaksha. Yaksha means a celestial being, hmm? a very bright luminous being appeared there and Indra looked at that being and said, who is this? Who has come into the heavens again? And then he sent Agni first to find out who this yaksha was. Agni went to the yaksha and then the yaksha placed a bit of straw in front of him and said, oh, I did not know who you are. The Agni said, you do not know me, I can burn down the whole world. I am the greatest Agni. And the yaksha said, oh, can you please burn this bit of straw for me? And then it seems Agni tried his best, huffed and puffed and tried to burn down that straw, but that straw would not burn. Hmm? And then Agni was very felt very strange, what is this something very strange is going on here and he went back to Indra and said, you see this is no ordinary being, something very mysterious going on. 
So you send somebody else and we will try to find out what is this. So he sent Vayu. Again the bit of straw was placed in front of Vayu and Vayu said you want me to blow out this bit of straw. I can do such great things. You do not know who I am. I am the mightiest God. And the Yaksha said yes please blow out this bit of straw now. But he could not do it. He also huffed and puffed and tried to blow out he who creates storms and thunderstorms and hurricanes on earth. He could not blow out that bit of straw. So he also came back to Indra and said this is a very mysterious being. He is not of the ordinary group. So try to find out who he is. Then Indra came there. As soon as Indra came that celestial being vanished. And then Brahma Vidya, the knowledge of Brahman came in an embodied form, in the form of a Devi there, Uma Haimavati. And she tells Indra that don't you know who was the celestial being? He was none other than Brahman, the supreme consciousness who came to show you that without his being there, without his permission, nothing can move. Agni cannot do anything, Vayu cannot do anything, none of you can do anything. So please acknowledge this. And she gave him this Vidya, that is why they say Indra became the greatest of the gods. What is this story trying to tell us? Basically the Upanishad is trying to tell you, without the presence of consciousness, even mind does not function. Not to speak of your sense organs, nothing will function. The mind itself, last time I showed you a slide with this figure, mind is lit up by ref consciousness reflected into it. And that is how the body also gets enlivened and that is how you are functioning in this world. So the source factor for all of this is consciousness, the self, the Atman standing behind everything due to which you are func being able to function in this world. This is what they are trying to tell you. The ontological primacy of consciousness in your personality, this is what they are trying to tell you in the midst of all these stories through all these verses. They are try, trying to point out to this. So this is a basic thing in Eastern philosophy. Please understand this. The ability to, of consciousness to function separate, to remain separate from mind function. Not that mind is consciousness. Mind is separate from consciousness. Mind is lit up by consciousness. That is why you have conscious experiences. This is characteristic of Eastern philosophical thought. Mm, especially Yoga Vedant. So here you have a concept of self which is totally independent of mind. Mind also is considered to be subtle matter but consciousness is not matter and that is why it has this ability to exist completely apart from mind function. Mm. So this is what is called the Atman. Now this is the core of your personality according to all these traditions and that getting reflected into the mind makes the mind function as a conscious entity. Is not it last time in those meditations you could see clearly your mind activity is objective to your being which means what you are able to control your thoughts if you want to, you are able to control your emotions if you want to, you are essentially apart from them. You go ahead and quickly identify because that is natural normal to the human experience to identify with your thought process to identify with your emotions but the real you is awareness which is being aware of that thought, which is aware of that emotion. So always your experience is always like this that you are able to see your thoughts. You see that is why memory is possible, is not it? You are able to remember what you thought which means you are apart from your thought, is not it logically correct? Hmm? Metacognition, thinking about thinking, how is it possible? Any neurophysiological activity, you, you see it for yourself. Unless you were apart from your thoughts, how will you remember them? How will you know them? So your essential, it is pointing only to your essential nature. We have not learned to think in this way. This is the whole problem. But the all this Upanishadic literature, what does it do for you is, it gives you an understanding of, your, of yourself far transcending your mind, your mental function. So it helps you control the mind. It gives you a stand apart from your mind and so it will help you understand everything about the mind, help you handle the mind effectively for your purposes. So 
mind is the next element of your personality which is supremely important. You see here let me point out some things initially. Mind is considered to be subtle matter according to Vedant. Hmm? Iska matlab kya hai? It functions on borrowed consciousness, isn't it? The reflection of consciousness falling in the mind is enlivening the mind and it is functioning. And it feeds on objects, sense objects to function, isn't it? You need sense data to think. If you actually see what is happening in your mind at this very moment, think and see, you are thinking thoughts based upon what you have seen, what you have heard, your thoughts, your mental activity is based upon your sense perceptions. This is one of the inlets to the mind, isn't it? Your sense perceptions, what you saw, what you hear, just now you are hearing this talk, so you are thinking along these lines. You are thinking about consciousness, you are thinking about mind function. This is one thing about your thought, the other thing is memory. Even if you are not taking in sense data, there is the unfolding of memory within you, which means in the past what you have thought will keep getting recycled in your mind. It blossoms forth as memory in your mind. This creates your entire mental world, your sense perceptions, sense data and memories. Hey na? Hmm? At any given moment of time, what is creating your thoughts? See, this is a very important question for you all because usually you identify yourself only with thought, the, your thought world. So, what is creating my thoughts? It is my sense perceptions and my memories. Now, here Yoga Vedanta make an enormous contribution, understanding for you. In order for you to understand entirely the mechanism of your mind, how you function, hmm? when you take in sense data from the external world, ab ab soch lo aapne aaj ek movie dekh liya. Uh, you saw a movie today, for the next whole one week, maybe you were, your mind was brooding over that movie, thinking about the same thoughts. So, the content of your mind was to a great extent decided by your sense perception. This is what I want you to see, right? Hmm? Then what happened as you go on repeating the things which you have seen in your mind, they will become habits, they will become sanskars. Sanskars means strong mental impressions. Then they do not remain in your conscious mind, they go into your subconscious mind, they will remain there. After a long time, maybe after two months or after six months, they will again blossom forth in the conscious mind and then you call them memories, right? Hmm? They are nothing but recycled conscious thoughts. You put it in at some point of time, now they are coming forth as memories. So, this entire cycle is going on day and night in your mind. This is a chakra actually which is described in the commentary on Patanjali Yoga Sutras, Vyas Bhashya. It is so important for you to understand how your thought mechanism is functioning. You take in sense data, it becomes your mental impression, it is converted into your memory and this cycle keeps going on and on all the time. And so, you feel I just cannot stop my thoughts. Even if I close my eyes, I close all sense perception, there is the replay of memory. So, you simply cannot stop the mind. How do I get peace of mind? How do I stop my mind? How do I stop my mind from going into negativities? Because we have not understood this basic cycle. Now, here let us observe a few more important points. See, first thing which you should understand is if you want to change the nature of your mind, what should you change if you have understood this cycle? You will first of all change your the input the intake through your sense, senses what you are taking in, sense perceptions, you will change the content of that. You will commit yourself only to the good things in life, not to negativities. Many times you take in negative impressions from the outside, is not it? Hmm? And then you, this is the first thing you will change. Secondly, you will start working on your memories, so that your memories are positive. Most of your thoughts are memories, please see this, so that your, you have good memories positive memories, things which give you happiness and peace. So, these are the two factors upon which you will work. So, please say this, you change your life through your thoughts, through your mind. You change the very nature of your brain through your mind. 
you know this is a huge field called neuroplasticity in neuroscience it means what the brain is very plastic very malleable at any given point of time if you think the right thoughts convert them into the right mental impressions and habits they they have they etch upon your brain and that etching is called an engram you know your thoughts the neurophysiological correlate of your thoughts in the mind is an engram in the brain when these thoughts become deep in your mind you are calling them sanskars mental impressions these are neurophysiologically called engrams actually the etching of your brain occurs based on these thoughts based on these sanskars isliye itna important hota hai regulating thinking properly our thought mechanism isn't this true see your own life hmm? and you will understand if you have positive thoughts if you have regulated ordered thinking clarity in the mind you can achieve anything just like that and if this is lacking then you will be struggling with unnecessary thinking all sorts of emotions negativities somebody's comment puts you into depression you'll be struggling with all this but if i have a very regulated thought world very clear thoughts and a lot of awareness in the mind then achievement is just a matter of time success is just a matter of time so the essential point is for you to observe this thought mechanism perfectly and understand it hmm? let me point out to a few more things here you see first thing i told you you change even your brain through your mind through your thoughts secondly your thoughts are objective to your experience you are not identified with your thought unless you want to be iska matlab hai anything happening in the mind you can perfectly see it as an object you are distanced from it if you practice that 5 minute meditation which has been circulated you will get a grip over this you will understand it by yourself that indeed i am always aware of my thoughts which means i am apart from them i the awareness i am watching the thought process if fear comes into the mind i the awareness i am watching the fear if anxiety comes i the awareness i am watching anxiety so it will not affect you it will not grip you it will not grip your life it will not make you miserable this is the great gain of this knowledge you understand it actually puts you in a position where you can handle every mental function then naturally you will have the experiences you want to have you will have the delights you want to have isn't it your thought is in your hands ye capacity dete hai the great knowledge of yog gives you this capacity to change your life as you want it to be otherwise it is at the mercy of your sense impressions and your memories whatever you have made them in the past so it gives you a hold over yourself hmm? this is the second point which you should know the third point is see most people ask this question after understanding the mechanics of the mind they ask this but how do i change my memories of the past i have al- already created a huge silo of memory as it were which is functioning within me without my permission you see even when you quiet the mind so many kinds of thoughts come into that mind isn't it in the past i have put in so many types of thoughts so many th- types of emotions now how do i control them how do i regulate them so memory is a huge part of study both in eastern and western philosophies because most of your thoughts are memories you know how yog vedanta studies memory isme se aap bahut kuch apne practical jeevan ke liye le sakte ho if you are alert you will get a number of points how do i handle my memory first of all vedanta will tell you memory is actually an asset it is one of the greatest clues to show you the existence of the self how memory is possible only if there has been a common factor between two events isn't it so it is actually showing you the presence of the atman the presence of the self it is hinting towards that hmm? the problem with you is you have messed up with that memory you have put in so much of negative thinking that <coughs> your memory in a sense has become negative this much has to be corrected so how do we do this <coughs> see 
if memory is nothing but recycled conscious thought, if I keep changing my conscious thought towards the positive, my memory will one day change, is not it? Hmm? Because its source is conscious thinking, your conscious thinking is becoming your memories. So, if I keep thinking positively, if I keep my sense exposures positive, one day my memories will be very positive. And just now, I will counteract my negative memories, there are definite methods for this by deliberately bringing positivity into my life. That is why in the yogic sciences, we, we actually work upon separating awareness from memory. Separating awareness for, from memory, what does this mean? See, you are of the nature of awareness, identified with the thought process. When you feel your memory is an impediment to your thinking, memories are negative. Through the practice of yoga, you can separate the thought process and thus your memory from your awareness. Through the practice of meditation, this can be done. If this is done, your memory will not have a hold over you. In fact, yoga aims at doing this. If it, you are able to free yourself from the grip of memory, only awareness will reign in your mind. Ye ek sambhavna hai. It is a possibility. Through the art of meditation, this can be done. When awareness dominates the mind, you know, the greatest happiness descends into the mind. Because there is no negativity there. You are in your real state. You have touched the real source of your being, which is awareness. And memory, you only allow that bit of memory to come in, which is useful to you, which is positive. The rest can be separated, kept apart from your experience through the practice of yoga, through the practice of meditation. Also, in Vedanta, they give you a very profound idea about memory, which is also useful to you. See, the very concept of apne shayad suna nahi hai abhi tak adhyas ek concept hai in uh, Vedant, hmm? which is the, the actual meaning of it is superimposition. It is a huge theory in Vedanta which tells you why are we seeing this world of manifestation the way we are seeing it. If actually the reality is only one substratum, one underlying Brahman, why am I seeing the world of manifestation? The answer given to this is because you have superimposed one thing on another. Do you understand the word superimposition? Hmm? See, now suppose, let me take the classic example of Vedanta only. You must pay attention, otherwise this will escape you. Hmm? In classical Vedanta, we use the rope and snake example. Have you heard of it? Huh? Somebody was going home at dusk time. He saw something like a rope lying there, but fear gripped his mind, so he actually thought it might be a snake. Then he went close and threw some light on it and saw it is only a rope, it is not a snake. So, the fear left him and he went home. Now, in this example, suppose there was a snake on that rope, you would call it imposition. But if you are mistaking the rope for the snake, you call it superimposition. First understand the word, superimposition means you are mistaking one thing for another. Now this happens due to memory according to Vedanta. The very, one of the very definitions of Adhyas is Smriti Rupa Paratra Purva Drishta Avabhasaha Adhyasaha, which means due to your memory, you are superimposing a, a thing seen elsewhere, a thing which was cognized elsewhere is being superimposed here due to the memory, functioning of your memory. Now, that is why the study of memory is so very important. Unless you are able to separate memory from awareness, delusion will reign, superimposition will occur at a very deep level. Superimposition is a very deep concept, which is actually telling you why Agnyan has come into the Jiva, which makes him see only multiplicity. So, memory works at a very deep level. That is why the initial techniques of yoga are trying to separate mind from awareness, which means the simple thought process from awareness. The next advanced techniques will help you separate your memories from awareness. If you can totally extract awareness from the grip of memory, you have passed in yoga, you have passed the test. Do not think these are uh, 
you know, it is only about lecturing and getting the knowledge of it. This is actually about doing. This is a very practical science. If you are doing a little bit, little, you will understand the relevance of these statements which we are making here. These are just theory lectures which I am giving you. The actual thing is to do it. If you are able to extract awareness from the thought process and memory, you, your job is done in a way. Mm, that awareness itself will teach you how to go further. You know, in yoga, yogic sciences, we say, yoga yoga na gnatavyo, yoga yoga pravartate. Yoga itself teaches yoga. Yoga itself will teach you how to progress in yoga. Agar ye simple cheese hai kar pao, distancing yourself from the thought process and separating memory and awareness. So, ye aap kar sakte ho, thoda karke dekho, at present, awareness is entirely invested in memory. That is why only your thought appears to be real to you. Nothing else appears to be real. Huh? When you close your eyes, initially what happens as if nothing else is there within. So, we do not find any interest in meditation, but as you develop become more and more conscious, as the mind becomes clearer and clearer, the entire interest will be riveted within, because awareness now suddenly means a lot to you. This is ye change aata hai, yoga ke practice se yehi change aata hai jeevan mein. You know, there is a very beautiful story which illustrates this. It is actually a joke. One uh, person was trying to search something in his garden. He was searching for a key in his garden. So, his neighbor came running and said, did you lose your key here? And he said, no, 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 I lost my key in the house. Then he asked, then why are you searching in the garden? Because there is light here. This may appear very foolish to you, we are doing that. We are searching for our identity, our happiness, everything only in the sense world, because we find light only when you open your eyes. Agar aankhe band karo to darkness lagta hai. Isilie you do not feel like doing this inner research, but through the practice of yoga, through training, andar alok mai hai, alok hi alok hai. Agar thodi training ho man, man ke liye. Only this clarity, this light can tell you how to progress further. It is the clarity of your awareness, please see this, uninvested awareness, not part of mind. It is separate from mind always. Vedanta again and again is trying to, in different ways trying to tell you this, that just like how you perceive this body as an object, see just like how I am seeing this laptop as an object, so also is the body an object to you, phenomenologically speaking. And so also is your thought process. That is why there is no common entity called I am the body. There is nothing like this. There is no coexistence of body, thought and I at the same plane. Always it is thought, through thought you are seeing the body, through awareness you are seeing even thought. And that is why you are always separate from the body-mind complex. Yek sambhavna sirf nahi hai, this is the reality about you. Isko sambhavna karne ke liye a little practice in yoga is required. This is the actual fact about you. So, this is the essential thing about the mind aspect of your personality, which Eastern philosophy may the main aspects of your personality, how they are covering, this is what I am introducing you to. This is a very huge topic, human personality. But yaha par hum essay study karenge because this is part of your syllabus. Now, the third thing which you should know about um, per human personality is, see we have this tendency why memory has been studied in so many ways, even in western philosophies for the simple reason, it is, it is the cause for your ignorance and unpurified uh, memory is the cause for your identification with the body mind complex. See constantly you are saying I am the body, I am the mind, I am my thoughts, I am, I am my emotions which means the characteristics of the self are superimposed on the body and thought and the characteristics of thought and body are superimposed on the self, which means I say I am fat or I am lean, the body is fat or lean, but I somehow join the I with that. So, both ways the adhyas is working, that is why my concept of myself becomes just the body mind. So, this fundamental error is due to superimposition, it is due to 
the confusion in our memory. If this can be cleared through the practice of yoga, what happens is you become more and more conscious. When you become more and more conscious, mind becomes absolutely clear. Aap hi dekh sakoge, aapka swaroop kya hai. Your awareness itself will lead you to the source of that awareness. It will not so easily get invested in anything because you refuse to identify merely with the body mind complex. So, that is why this study is so very important for understanding human personality. Otherwise, you know your sense of yourself will only be based upon what others think of you. If you do not have this level of research, you know this is what will happen. Your sense of yourself is only determined by what your family says about you, that also is secondary. What your friends say about you, what society says about you, how you appear, this will be your superficial sense of yourself. And so, you are at the mercy of every single person's comment, every single person's idea about you. You have nothing by yourself to know about yourself. Only this kind of a subjective research gives you a sense of yourself completely apart from all this. Hai na? Hmm? That is why this philosophy is strength giving. Vivekananda hamesha ye bolte the, it will put you on your own feet. You have a sense of yourself completely independent of what others say about you or think about you even. Because you know the essence of your personality. So, this is where this research actually leads you to. It gives you immense strength and clarity. The third aspect of your personality after the self and mind is the body. In most of these eastern traditions, the body is considered to be a garment you are wearing and stitched together by your karma, by your thought and by your desire. These are the three threads you use to stitch this garment of the body. You know karma, hum jo karma karte hain, that to a great extent decides the kind of body we get. Hmm? And the experiences that body will go through and the lifespan of that individual, all of this is decided by karma. And then your thought mechanism, right now you can feel it. If you are in a very stressed out state, it will tell on your body also, isn't it? Your thought mechanism decides how your body is and your desire, the basic uh, emotional equipment within you, your will, all these contribute to the creation of your body. So, if you want the body to be at ease, if you want the body to remain healthy, you must take care of all this, the, the threads with which you have stitched up the body. It is not enough to consume a pill and consider ourselves to be healthy. Isn't it? Ajkal hmm? na, it has become a, a kind of a trend to keep, try to be healthy through external factors, through supplements, by uh, changing your neurochemistry. You tell me one simple thing, if you want to be happy and joyous, if you take an injection of dopamine, which is supposed to be your uh, pleasure hormone, do you think you will be joyous if you take an injection of dopamine? It is a neurochemical which is responsible, not the hormone, it is a neurochemical responsible for the feel of pleasure. Will a shot of dopamine make you happy? It will not, unless your mind is happy, unless your thought is beautiful, peaceful. That is why I said you change everything through the power of your thought. point? How do you feel joy? You do not feel it as dopamine or adrenaline, you feel it as a lightness, as a buoyancy in your system, as a joy in your mind, as happiness in your mind. So, take care of your mind, that is most important. How do you feel pain? You do not feel it as a serotonin or epinephrine, you feel it as agony in your heart. So, take care of your emotions take care of your thought and emotion, you will take care of your states of mind and your life. Do not try to bring in external, giving in to drink, to addictions, all this is not going to control your emotions and thought or bring happiness into your life. It will only addict you towards that. If you can handle your thought process maturely, you will always be happy. Hai na? Isi liye yog ek aisa marg hai jo, it brings the natural 
innate happiness into manifestation in your life. You do not require synthetic things to keep you happy. Isko, inko synthetic joys bolte, which means I require something external to keep me entertained and happy, otherwise I will go into depression. So, do not become such a slave to these things. It is in your own experience, you are capable of handling your thought process. Iske liye methods hai, techniques hai, which also we will be going into deeper into that. But understand uh, how the this whole mechanism works. So, what are the three aspects of your personality which we studied? First of all, the self, the Atman, then the mind and then the body which is a manifestation, actually a creation of your mind. Hai na? Hmm? So, if I have to handle, I mean get joy out of my experience of life, I must be able to pay the right attention, handle all of these three properly. So, isi ko sadhana kehte hain, tuning in to the reality of life, not to live on superficial and synthetic planes. Hmm? This is what yoga and Vedanta are trying to teach you. See, it is a do it yourself technique. Every technique of yoga is a do it yourself method. They are not asking you to believe in something. Ye koi belief ki matter hai, jo, jo hum yaha discuss kar rahe hai. is it a belief system? Tell me. It is a science, is not it? It is not a belief system. In belief systems, you can fall into all sorts of trouble. Let me tell you another small story here because all of you have become so serious. Hmm? Let me tell you this. See, there is one, um, there was one little child who had this tendency of coming home very late. He was 5, 6 years old all the time playing with his friends and he would come home late at night, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. So, the mother was very worried that this fellow is playing with his friends for such a long time. So, she frightened him by telling him, you know there are uh, ghosts which come out once it is dark and they can catch you. So, do not play out for so long, come, come home before it is dusk. So, the child got frightened and started coming home early. Then this fear remained with that child. So, that when he became a teenager also, he would be frightened to go out in the dark. And uh, he even to go for errands, to go to his friend's house, to go for studies, tuitions, he could not go. So, then the mother gave him a medal, a talisman jo bante, and told him this will protect you from the ghost, so you go. So, this is what belief systems do, mm. creating a problem and then giving you a remedy for it. These are no belief systems, these are sciences in themselves, it is a do it yourself technique. If you plunge into your own mind you will discover all of this yourself. There is no need to believe. In fact, if you do not believe even better, you will arrive at it by yourself. Is it a fact that my awareness is apart from my mind function? Is it a fact that my thought is objective to my experience? Is it a fact that I am able to see the body and handle it as an object? Is it a fact that my memories can be cleansed? It is for you to discover it by yourself. Yahi mein aapko Isiliye do that 5 minute meditation every day to get charge over yourself. Hmm? Now, we will move on to the second part of this uh, theory lecture which is on western philosophy. What has it to say about the human personality paradigm, hmm? human personality structure? I told you it is essentially dichotomous which means to say it considers body and mind to be the two aspects of myself, self and what is called soul is actually the higher mind. Usually this, it is not that people have not discovered the self there, what we are calling the Atman, but this is the general understanding, a dichotomous personality structure. If you actually compare, let me show you a slide here, which will help you understand this even better. If you actually compare and see uh, both these stands. See here, just observe this Eastern philosophies and Western philosophies. Observe this slide. You see, in Eastern philosophy, the, the concept of self, hmm, let me just go through this a bit, has been different in different philosophies. But in the Shad Darshan, which we discussed in the last class, hmm, the concept of self or Atman is similar, slight variation is there, that it is a unit of consciousness separate from body and mind. But you see, the, some other Eastern philosophers have given different versions of the self, like Ati Prakrit, sun as self. The Charvaks used to cons consider body or sense organs 
even prana, even mind as self, hmm. shanika vidya, intellect as self, the six orthodox schools which we discussed, shraddarshan, atman as self, sankhya and yoga philosophies, purusha as self, the bhattas which means mimamsakas because Kumarila Bhatta was one of their main uh, propounders. So, he considered consciousness with ignorance as self, the Buddhists consider void as self, Vedanta considers pure consciousness as self. Hmm? Now, observe this, the concept of self might have been different in many of these philosophies, but the essential philosophies based on the Vedas, the Shad Darshan, they have very similar concept of self. Hmm? Only the, purush, the difference between self, Purusha and Atman, Sankhya and Vedanta was this, Purushas are many in number. This is how Kapila saw it. Hmm? Consciousness, because it is individualized in so many, it, it appears as many, but it is an appearance. Vedanta, that is why that is the culmination of this thinking, Vedanta. It will tell you that it is one consciousness only reflected in different minds, so it appears to be different. Hmm? So, similar idea of self, consciousness apart from body mind function. This is the crux of the whole thing, this is the glory of this philosophy actually, Vedanta, hmm? pointing out to the source of your being, the real you. Now, in western philosophies, you can see last time we discussed this Avicenna's floating man experiment. Right, which means if you cut off a person from all sensations, still he will have a sense of his presence, and that is why self awareness is something, something there in the human being. The human being is essentially self awareness, sensations are secondary. So, this kind of an understanding has come from many philosophers in the West. You will see today the most common theories are what is called the emergent phenomenon, which means. Uh, you know, even science subscribes to this. They say that consciousness is an emergent property of the brain. Brain is primary and consciousness is as it were a byproduct of the brain. Hmm? There are many scientists who are for this, many, many who are against this. So, it is a point of debate. Then, soul or higher mind is also considered to be the self by many western philosophers. Then, there is this bundle theory of self. You see, this is, these are some of the theories which you should understand. Hmm? Try to understand step by step. I will put it forth as simply as possible. What does the bundle theory, it was propounded by Hume, David Hume, the Scottish philosopher of uh, 19th century. He said that actually what you are feeling in the mind is nothing but perceptions continuously moving in flux. So, a bundle of these perceptions is what is called self. This was his idea of self. Hmm? Then you have the center of gravity theory, which means uh, it was propounded by Dennett, who said that you know it is a convenient fiction, the concept of self. Huh? There is, uh, if you actually uh, penetrate and see, you do not find anything called self, like in center of gravity. If I say the center of gravity of this bottle, now there is a center of gravity, but you cannot see it, but you needed to solve problems of physics, is not it? A center of gravity. So, also there is a center of reference called the self, but you cannot see it, it is not something tangible. So, this is another theory, these are all theories how phil different philosophers have thought. After that, you have the syntactic theory, it is a it is again a construct, which means it is a the yourself is a tool for self reference in order to refer to I, myself, herself, yourself. So, I use the word self this was propounded by Sloman. So, he said that it is just a tool for self reference, we do not know if there is anything called a self. Then some people consider the self to be memory concretized, this is another theory for self. And then there have been the mystics of the west who have come very close to the Vedantic idea of Atman, like Misha Rakat used to call it essential being. Kant called it subject in itself. Hmm? And then Schopenhauer, who went a little further than Kant and came close to the Vedantic idea of Atman, he called it being in itself, the self. Hmm? And then Edmund Husserl called it transcendental ego, Paul Tillich called it true being, Aldous Huxley called it the eternal self, Emerson, 
who was very much influenced by Bhagavad Gita, Eastern thought, he called it the eternal one. Many of these philosophers have talked about the, the possibility of the existence of pure consciousness in itself, what Vedanta is calling the Atman. They have talked about it. In fact, Kant came close to the idea of what in Sankhya is called the Purusha. He came close to that idea and that is why Vivekananda once commented that Vedanta begins where Kant ends. Schopenhauer came close to the idea of the Atman, pure consciousness. So, you see mystics speak the same language. Everywhere people have intuited the presence of this, this the self, pure consciousness, apart from mind function. But in, with, uh, in India, it became a full scale philosophy, which has it is a living philosophy. Even today, we are discussing it, we are practicing it. Yoga and philosophy, uh, yoga and Vedanta are living philosophies here. So, a whole lot of mind, it is part of a collective memory, that is why. You will find yogis here and there. In IITs, there are plenty of yogis. You will find people deeply interested in this because of the simple fact it is part of our collective memory. We have learned to think about the reality of this. This is why strike karta hai hame. Hai na? Hmm? See how many of you are deeply interested, I can see it. So, this is the point, this can be researched into. So, this is a general idea about self in different philosophies. Now, after we go through this, let us come to the concept of mind in Western philosophy. See, the higher mind, many philosophers consider the higher mind only to be the self, hmm? which means there is a lower mind and a higher mind. A lot of psychological uh, understanding came through this discipline, the, the different branches of psychology in understanding the mind, just like how in India, the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, the, the yoga system threw enormous light on the nature of the mind, especially the functional classification of the mind, how it works, how to change thoughts, all of this memory we discussed. So also in Western philosophy, a lot of energy has been invested in the study of the mind and the contributions, I think you know something of it of Freud, Jung, Adler. Hmm? giving us the structural classification of the mind, the presence of the subconscious and unconscious. So, all this contributed to the advancement of psychology in the West. And finally, they also came to an understanding, a very solid understanding of memory. They have exhaustively studied memory. You know, in fact, the self by some philosophers is considered to be a self memory system, which means the self is nothing but self images plus memory. And the whole understanding of memory, it is useful for anybody, it is a whole science in itself. See, let me tell, tell you the, the understanding of memory in uh, Western uh, psychology. Hmm? This understanding is important to all of us. You see, memory has been divided into long term memory and short term memory. Just keep your eyes on the slide, hmm? in long term memory, short term memory you know what it is about. Uh, just in, in a very small span of time, what you can retain is short term mem memory. But long term memory is important for us to understand for various reasons. It is of two types, the memory which stays with you, hmm, which is part of you. You see, it is of two types, declarative, which means explicit memory and non-declarative, which means implicit memory. Explicit memory means it is part of your conscious mind. You can consciously revive it. A implicit memory means it is not part of your conscious mind, it is in the subconscious. Now, in declarative memory, again you have episodic memory and semantic memory. Please see that episodic memory is events, actually they are episodic means episode like mm, snapshots of your personal past you can say, which come into your conscious mind and semantic memory means facts which flow in your conscious mind. Now, this episodic memory is very important, both of these memories actually. Please pay attention to this, hmm? try to understand what I am I'm going to give you some very important points here. Episodic memory are snapshots of your personal past which are available to your conscious mind. Now, these snapshots of your personal past are very deep rooted. Even people with amnesia have a coherent sense of self and they can give you an autobiographical sketch of themselves. Only Alzheimer's removes this. So, episodic memory is primarily your memory. 
semantic memory is facts about yourself. Episodic memory just like how it provides you can say the phenomenological continuity of your identity. Semantic memory provides the narrative continuity of your identity. It is facts about yourself. So, both of these constitute a huge part of your memory and it is, it is your self basically speaking because most people ident it is not the Atman what I am meaning to say is because people identify with their thought process with their memories essentially it is your episodic and semantic memory that you are identifying with. So, you see here specific personal experiences from a particular time and space constitutes episodic memory and facts all the knowledge you collect, collect from outside world knowledge, objective knowledge, object knowledge, language knowledge, conceptual priming. So, these form the essential part of your long term memories and the second thing is impl in implicit memories you have see they are not available to your conscious mind. Mm, you cannot recollect them just like that, but they will pop up in your mind go to the last bit there all your skills both motor and cognitive they have become part of your memory is not it automatically you can do many things like drive a motorcycle or change the gears of your car automatically it is happening why it has become part of your memory system part of your non declarative implicit memory perceptual priming conditioned responses these are all non declarative memory then habits habits and sensitization all these have become part of your non declarative implicit memory a kind of long term memory. So, you see the, these are all facts about ourselves which we should know in order to understand how our mind is functioning is not this very interesting huh? what constitutes the you as the mind hmm? what, what are the essential things that which you should know is this bit and after this is of course, we have the third aspect of the human personality body you have the whole medical science telling you everything that you need to know about the body how it is functioning your neurophysiology your neurochemistry how is it that you, you see mind affects body is not it if you have a solid knowledge of mind it will itself give you a good knowledge of the body do not try to know body just as body it is through the mind through your uh, let me give you a simple example suppose you are in a state of anxiety where is the actual cause for your anxiety or stress tell me the root causes in your mind uh, just taking something in the body for the body will not remove the causal condition is not it the cause lies in your mind. So, even to change the body even to improve the body the health of the body you require a certain hold over your mind people who are habitually calm very one pointed and people who practice a certain amount of yoga you know a certain calmness comes even into the body a certain uh, kind of ability to control your emotions ability to remain still naturally comes into the body regulated breathing these are all part and parcel this is one unit please see this the body mind complex and you are apart from it. So, if you train this unit by itself it will keep functioning properly, but if we do not have enough knowledge of this then well you need external things to keep the body and mind happy. Hmm. Today this has become a huge problem the different forms of addictions even the addictions on for over the internet of mobile it is all due to your incapacity to control your mind and no amount of training has happened to the body. So, it affects your bodily health you know people who are in depression they sleep for long hours and they take all sorts of drugs just to keep calm tranquilizers. So, aisi halat kyu honi chahiye such a precious human life we have and you can attain so much through this if you only regulate your energies discipline the body and mind a little understand these basic facts about your own personality and you can lead a glorious life. So, this is why this is being given to you. Next thing I do not want to go into the bodily aspects more because you have the whole of medical science giving you all the facts about it, but here we will 
dwell on one thing which you have to know philosophical perspectives on uh, personality types this is also part of your curriculum because see there is a world of difference in thinking these philosophical perspectives affect my personality and in thinking my personality decides the perspectives if you just observe this slide look at the first content of this slide freedom versus determinism hmm? which means free will, will each of these points which i have given five points there they are huge philosophical debates which have been going on for centuries hmm? what is the truth about human experience is it free will or is it determinism ye aapne have you heard about this earlier we had a huge session on this in the last course is man free to do what he wills और इज एवरीथिंग प्री ऑर्डेन्ड प्री डिटर्मिंड तो ये क्वेश्चन कभी कभी हमारे मन में आता है ना हाउ विल यू सॉल्व दिस इट्स अ फिलोसफिकल क्वेश्चन एम आई फ्री टू डू वॉट एवर आई वॉन्ट और आर देर फोर्सेस रेस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर माई डूइंग वॉट एवर आई वॉन्ट टू डू सो द आंसर टू दिस इज इफ अ मैन इज फुल्ली कॉन्शियस ही इज फ्री अदरवाइज देर आर external and internal factors which are responsible for what you will do so it is a predetermined thing so if you have made yourself conscious not compulsive if you have moved away from compulsive habits made yourself conscious yes free will is there for you so you see the personality affects the perspective and not exactly that the philosophical perspective is affecting the personality this is the great glory of the yogic sciences it makes you independent of everything each of these philosophical points you can see is there are huge debates see when you grow up and when suppose you get to debate upon all of this you will understand for centuries thinkers have invested a lot of thought on trying to solve these things uniqueness versus individuality ye bhi aap dekhiye is the human being unique or is there a common factor in all human beings there are both sides are very strong hmm? like this question discusses the extent of each person's human's individuality or uniqueness versus similarity in nature or universality abraham maslow carl rogers were all advocates of the uniqueness of individuals in contrast mystical traditions are speaking of a universal dimension to human personality what is the truth this again depends on the level of development of the human personality if he has become a fully conscious being he is universal in outlook because the nature of awareness is inclusive one awareness shining in all beings and if he has not made himself that way he is stuck to the body and mind he will be exclusive isn't it he will be just an individual one individual so you see each of these perspectives depends upon the level of development of the individual take the next one active versus reactive this also you see this question explores whether humans primarily act through individual initiative or through outside stimuli traditional behaviorists typically believed that humans are passively shaped by their environments whereas humanistic and cognitive theorists believe that humans are more active in their role now what is the reality about this again it depends upon how you have made yourself that will decide whether you are active or re merely reactive so also optimistic versus pessimistic again it is a condition of your mind what is the nature of the mind you have developed nature versus nurture this is also a huge debate in educational circles again what you see if you are strong enough within if you have created the right sanskars you, what comes to you in the form of external stimuli will be secondary you have your own stand your strength is within yourself if you have made yourself like that anything coming from outside will be of secondary importance to you hai na but if you are nobody if you have not created this inner strength not penetrated within yourself not ordered your mind clarified your mind you are at the mercy of every outside stimuli stimulus and that is why then you see the joint influence of outside factors on you hmm. so please see this the personality ultimately is going to decide the perspective what we make of ourselves in life is supremely important vivekananda always used to say this that you are the makers of your 
destiny. You are the creators of your destiny. If you know how to regulate and handle your body mind complex, if you give it some minimal amount of training, you can take your whole life into your hands. And if you are a mere compulsive individual, compulsive itself means you are compelled by something outside to make changes. If you have made yourself like that, then yes, external factors are going to rule you. So, development of human personality means essentially this, not polishing merely the surface, developing your mind, your higher faculties, developing this higher intellect dhi, which is able to understand all of this and developing, growing in self-knowledge, knowledge of the real unchanging you. If you take this as the scheme of development, then I can tell you, you will make a glorious human personality a personality who will contribute greatly to the advancement of everything in this world and bringing great happiness to yourself also, great success in your own life. And if you do not work on your essential personality, mind and the higher nature of the mind, then you will remain stuck to external forces depending on a little thing, little, little things to keep you happy and entertained and sort of a slave to the external world. So, the point in giving you all this information is this only, you will develop your personality by yourself, understanding all this, hmm? learning a few of these techniques. Okay? We will stop today's session here, this session was only on human personality, next time we have a very important session on mind and perception, do not skip that session, hmm? because the how the mind works in perceiving, this is what we are going to study. Hmm? We will end today's session here.